So hi, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar organized by JetBrains. I'm Jody Birchall, data science developer advocate, and I will be your host. I promise I do know my job title. So I'm so pleased to have my friend Victoria Slocum here today for today's webinar to present on efficient information extraction from text with Spacey. So Victoria is a developer advocate at Explosion, the extremely cool company behind a range of Python natural language processing packages, including Spacey, and they're based right here in my hometown of Berlin. So welcome, Victoria. It's so great to be here. Thanks so much for doing with this with me, and I'm so excited to yeah, get started and tell you about Spacey and Prodigy. I am super pumped about this one. I'm always <laughs> pumped about my webinars, but Spacey has definitely a special place in my heart, and we're going to get to that in a second. But First, I wanted to maybe tell people about how we met, which is uh, when you relocated to Berlin in the middle of winter in January of this year. So how are you settling in, especially now that the weather is finally getting bearable? I mean, it's always been a dream of mine to move to Europe, and I really do love Berlin. And it's so mm. fun to see the city like come alive. Now the weather's <laughs> warming up and people are going outside. Um, it's super nice. And also, I'm like learning German, so I'm starting mm. to have like basic conversations in German, which is super Yay. fun. So it's been great. Amazing. Yeah. yeah, it's like a different city, and it's like people are not angry anymore. <laughs> You're just no. like, wow, <laughs> people can be nice. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. So let's move on to Spacey. And um, I think this is a package that's definitely going to be familiar to people who have done a lot of text processing, but there's going to be some people in the audience who are new to this area. So would you mind giving us an overview of Spacey and some of the other tools that Explosion has created for doing NLP or natural language processing in Python? Yeah, yeah, definitely. So Explosion has two main tools right now. Um, the first is Spacey. Uh, mm -hmm. which is an open source library for basically production level natural language processing. So we provide a bunch of models and training capabilities for a range of use cases and also different languages. Um, so this can include like NER, text categorization, um, and a bunch of different stuff. Uh, we also have also, like over 20 different languages, I think, supported languages mm -hmm. uh, with pre-trained pipelines. And you can also train your own pipelines. And I think we're coming out with new ones for Slovenian and Serbian soon. So keeping oh, cool. uh, an eye out for that. Um, yeah, and then Prodigy is our annotation tool. So um, it also provides a range of applications and integrates with Spacey. Um, so you can do different NLP annotation tasks um, like Name to date recognition or text categorization also. Um, also, it's fully scriptable. Um, so you can also customize it to fit your specific project and use case. Uh, we really focus on like the developer experience. Um, one of my favorite things about our products, and I talk about a lot, is how you customize everything, but you can still get it started easily with the out-of-the-box solutions, which is super cool. Yeah, and um, like we've talked about this before, and I think I've talked about it before on other webinars. So I spent quite a lot of my data science career in natural language processing, <laughs> use Spacey a lot. Like I think my my first like big natural language processing job, I was doing multilingual data um, like processing. So I know it's it's really difficult. <laughs> there are a lot of quite unique challenges. Um, so you know given that you work at a company that's devoted to this, would you maybe mind giving the audience um, like an overview of some of the challenges you can have with text processing and actually maybe a teaser of how you're going to be solving them today? Yeah, definitely. So, I mean, natural language processing can be hard in a ton of different ways. Um, I mean, there's the data portion. You can be dealing with unstructured or inconsistent uh, text data, simply low quantity or quality data, potentially for underrepresented languages, mm -hmm. or you're trying to find the right bundle of labels for annotation, the right annotation guidelines, or you're trying to figure out the best model for your production solutions and evaluating all of it. So there's a lot of different places for things to get messed up, for things to go wrong. Um, and in order to get a good output, you often have to have a lot of knowledge about all the parts of your pipeline. <laughs> Yeah, from the data to the annotation to the model to the evaluation. <laughs> um, yeah, so this requires a lot of iteration and prototyping and figuring out like what works best for your specific projects. Um, yeah, in the project I'm going to demo today, um, we took a data set that looks at restaurant reviews um, and has a lot of different um, named entity labels, um, such as like the restaurant name, the cuisine, the location. I think there's about eight labels in total. We'll look at them a little more. 
Um, but when we're initially working on the projects, um, we're trying to combine like the rule-based systems with an NER model. And we noticed kind of a lower accuracy output than we would expect. Um, and so I went back and reviewed the annotated data set that we took um, from MIT. Um, and we found a lot of like inconsistent annotations that were really affecting our rules and our model. Um, so obviously there's a lot of challenges, but I feel like consistency in annotation and output can definitely be a big one. Um, mm. We always say that machine learning is not like a magical solution, right? Um, yeah, even with like the large language models coming out, you still require like data and knowledge and iteration um, to get the use case with an output that's robust and production and is reliable. And it really, really requires a lot of effort. Yeah, and, and that's the thing like, um... At the, the job I was talking about, we had this whole ontology, which was based on like linguists actually creating grammar rules for how like job titles and skills would work in different languages. And like our whole kind of natural language based search was based on this ontology and it was a huge amount of work. Um, but I also like the other point that you brought up, which is even with the large language models that are coming out, because I've been thinking so much about data issues since ChatGPT was released. Um, so to give a bit of context to people in the audience, I know you know this, Victoria, um, <laughs> the earlier GPT models, like GPT-3 and earlier, they had like really, really huge problems which came from using uncurated data. So things like hallucinations, we've seen those, but also like bias and hate speech and things like that. And that was actually why ChatGPT was created. So it was basically they use this hand curated um, data set to fine tune the model and make it a bit less, you know, <laughs> liable to lying and being racist. Um, but yeah, like, do you kind of think that, you know, this sort of fine tuning process is, is enough or like based on your experience with working with text data? Yeah, I mean, so for one, I think all the work going on with the large language models is super exciting. I mean, there's so many possibilities for this going forward. Um, mm -hmm. and it's just very exciting to see where all, all will go. Um, there's still a lot of problems, like you mentioned, um, when you try to put these models into production. I mean, it has gotten a little bit better um, mm. with the biased stereotypes, hallucinated facts, um, but you still kind of require that human the loop action a little bit. Yeah. Um, also, these models are still very English oriented. Um, you know, there's a lot of problems with potentially like other languages, underrepresented languages. Um, and I also feel like there's a big problem with um, basically when you when you query a large language model, um, you basically get a unstructured and potentially unreliable output, um, which mm -hmm. you do need some sort of framework to still work with, right? Um, because it's just a text-based output. You still get just text. Um, yep. And you also need somewhere to evaluate the results you get. Um, yeah, so labeled data isn't going away. Um, and I think frameworks are still going to be pretty important to like move behind, move beyond like testing and like into production level sort of projects. Um, and we're actually hopefully releasing our spacey large language model repo today, possibly. Yay! So exciting. <laughs> So keep an eye out for that. Um, we'll be uh, announcing it on Twitter, um, hopefully soon. Um, so after releasing some recipes in Prodigy for working with open AI to do some like labeling to make um, like easier and faster annotation um, iteration, we've been really thinking about the best way to combine like CC and Prodigy um, into this, this growing field of LLMs. Um, one good thing is they do allow you to prototype quickly, but like going behind the prototyping, you still need like something that ensures reliability, structured output. And as of right now, this does require some additional tooling. So um, we'll be continuing to work on expand this repo um, and integrate LRMs into a process for fast prototyping, but also like a structured and reliable framework for production and evaluation also. Yeah. I, I'm super excited about like the evaluation side in particular is a little underdeveloped like I know Hugging Face has some stuff but it's it's super cool to see companies like Explosion working on it as well um yeah. okay so I think um we've done quite a lot of nattering and probably everyone's <laughs> very excited to get into the demo so let's jump into it um so there's a little bit of admin just to get through um before we can start so 
we do like to keep this webinar as conversational and interactive as possible. I can actually already see that a question has come in. So thank you very much. So if you do have any questions or issues during the webinar, please do let us know in the chat on YouTube. And I'm going to be keeping an eye on that chat. And we're going to have a couple of pauses where Victoria will be able to answer your questions. So please don't wait for the end. Keep them coming in as you're thinking of them. And we will get to those during those breaks. And please also be aware this webinar is being recorded currently, and that recording is going to be available right after the webinar ends, also on YouTube. So if you have any points you want to save or revisit from the webinar, that recording is going to be available, available for you right after we finish. So we have all of the admin out of the way. So let's hand over to Victoria, and she's going to show us what we can do by coupling machine learning and manual annotation using Spacey and Prodigy. Yeah, awesome. So um, today I'm going to go over um, this basically the Spacey project that I made, um, as I mentioned, to combine like an NER system with also a rule based approach. Um, so I'll be going over both the Spacey project system and kind of how we set up this project, how we use Prodigy to re annotate some data, um, and then basically the output that we got and kind of lessons learned from the whole project. Um, so first thing I wanted to do is I wanted to introduce the Spacey project system. Um, so we created this system in order to create like reproducible and reliable projects that you can share, um, basically um, like a framework for, for projects. And um, the heart of this project is the project.yaml. So um, uh, you can see here we have like a title, a description, um, and we have a whole bunch of other information also, variables and directories and assets um, and workflows and commands, right? Um, and so this is all created um, when you run basically the commands spacey project um, or clone. And then basically the folder, which the tutorials are in, and then span ruler reviews. So in a particularly virtual environment where you have Spacey installed, when you run this command, it'll basically output a folder like this um, with all the cloned information from the, um, from the project. Yeah. So um, the project is, um, so the span of the restaurant reviews, basically what we're trying to do with this project. Um, is we took a data set, which is the MIT Restaurant Reviews data set. And in this data set, um, it's an IOB formatted um, data, which we'll get into in a second. But we've labeled um, named entities such as rating, location, restaurant name, price, dish, amenity, and cuisine. Um, and these are a whole bunch of restaurant views. Um, and so basically what we wanted to do was we wanted to basically demo our uh, rule-based system, our span rule component, in a, within a named entity recognition pipeline to see if we could get like, um, a better uh, evaluation, better metrics, um, yeah, better output from combining this rule-based system with the NER. Um, so the way we did that was we first trained a NER model and we treat it as our baseline. Um, and then we just basically attach the span ruler component after the NER component um, to give us pipelines that we can compare. Um, basically, what kind of happened um, is we trained our NER model. We got basically a score of 76% accuracy. Um, when we added the span ruler component, we only got about a 1% increase. Um, this was kind of bad. Um, we wrote over 500 lines of rules, which took over, and this wasn't the increase we were expecting. Um, so when I went back into the original data set, um, I basically found a lot of inconsistencies in how the data was annotated. And I'll show this, but I basically went back and created a Prodigy workflow to re-annotate this data set, provide more consistent annotations, um, and then make better data to get a better output. Um, but let's start at the beginning. Um, we're going to go through basically the Spacey project workflow, kind of how it all would run in the command line, um, how you can run it, and basically what's going on behind the scenes. 
So the first thing is we're using the SPACI model that pre-trained English large vectors. Um, and you can see here, this is a SPACI project command. Basically, when you run SPACI project, run, for example, download, it will run this command and download a SPACI model with pre-trained vectors. So you can see here, it's collecting the English large vectors and downloading them. Um, yeah. And um, I already have these downloaded, so we can just stop that process. Um, but yeah. And so then after that, we're basically pre-processing the data. Um, and we can see here, what we've done here is we have the raw IOB data. And you can see that it's labeled with B rating, which is the start of an entity, and then I rating, which is basically any other token in the entity. We have a lot of different data here. Um, these are all separate entries. Um, you can see here restaurant name, open till hours, um, a lot of different data. We have a train and a test set that we got directly from the MIT restaurant reviews. Um, so we're pre-processing this data, basically um, making into Spacey's binary format. So then we can train a Spacey model. Um, and this data is just simply going into the corpus folder based on the script. Um, and we see we have here like a dev test, a test set, and a train set. Um, and this is what we use for model, model training and evaluation. So then we're going to train a baseline NER model. And for this, we are using the spacey train command. Um, the spacey train command is pretty cool because it allows you to simply train a model based on some data. Um, so you simply pass in a config file. Um, our config system allows you to basically set up your pipeline components and change stuff around. Um, it looks pretty complicated when you first get started, um, but this is auto-generated through a script on our website in our quick start. Um, so this is just all the, the normal stuff that you see in the training quick start with the addition of our English large vectors, um, which we've changed out. So you can see here in our pipeline, we have a tokenizer. And we also have a NER component. And this is basically what makes up our pipeline. So this is everything in there. Um, we're using the default spit heat tokenizer, the default NER settings. Um, you can see all the settings here. Nice thing about the config is nothing is ever hidden behind defaults or hidden behind other things. So everything is in this config, and you can swap anything out with what you need. But for this, we're actually just using the default. Um, OK, so back to the project YAML, back to the train command. We're also passing in the train set for the train command and the dev set, which is what the train command will use to evaluate within each iteration. We're passing in the vectors, uh, which is our English large vectors, which we set as a variable so we can use in other places as well. Our output is just going to go in our training folder. And if you have a GPU ID, you can change that in your variables, but ours is just nothing. OK, so when we run this command, um, it takes about two hours, so I won't be doing that today. <laughs> um, but basically, you get out a NER model, which is super cool. One command, pass in some data, and you get out an NER model. Um, so you can see that model within our training folder. And model best, you can see here we have our NER component, our talk to vec component, our vocab, configs, um, meta information. Um, basically everything you need to make a model, um, machine learning model. Um, now that we have our model, we can assemble it with the span ruler component. Um, and let me talk about the span ruler component a bit. So this component allows you to create rules, um, like handwritten rules to make within a pipeline, on top of a pipeline. Um, and the span ruler component works with both NER and also with our span cat component, which instead of um, token based spans, it labels like span span. So it can be multiple, uh, it can be overlapping, it can be arbitrary. Um, yeah, so NER is a little bit more token based, span, span uh, cat is a little bit more span based. Um, so we can go and take a look at that config. This is our NER ruler config. Um, this is very similar to our NER config. The main differences is we've also added a span rule component. So we have three components within our pipeline instead of two. 
Um, and we've also added our patterns, our rules. Um, we've done this by adding our rules within a registry component, which we can check out that Python file. Um, and you can see here we've registered restaurant rules within our registry. And in the config, you can just pull that in. Um, so you can see here we have a, a lot of different rules, um, a lot of different rules, <laughs> over 600 lines of rules. Um, and we've just created manual patterns to match and go on top of the NER model to basically fine tune, make it better. Um, so if the NER model didn't pick up English pub as a restaurant name, now it would with the NER ruler model. Um, so we've done spacey assemble, we pass in our config, we pass in our um, output directory, our source for the tokenizer, our source for the NER, and basically the code for the rules, pot, rules file, which pulls in the registry component. Um, and basically what that gets you out is a model again, um, but this model has the rules on top of it. So it's hopefully a little bit better. So then we can use a spacey evaluate command to evaluate each model. And I went over those metrics a bit, but we can take a closer look at them. So we have our baseline, which we got a score of 0.75, um, which is fine. Uh, not the best for an NER model, but it's not the worst either. Um, and then we also have a combined score. So this is basically our NER plus spin ruler component. And we can see it's a little bit better not the best, better. Um, so I saw this and I was like, why? We have 600 lines of rules, this sucks. <laughs> um, basically, and I took a look actually at our splits for the training data. And what I noticed first of all is that the rating actually got worse when we added the span balloon. This really surprised me. If we're adding rules, it should make it better, not worse. Why is this the case? Um, so I went back into the training data and I basically found that sometimes things were labeled as part of the rating label, sometimes they were not. For example, like um, within our rules, if you had a five star review, um, the NER model might label this as, or the original data set might label this as five star, one entity, or it might label it as five star review, one entity. Um, and this was creating a lot of inconsistencies, right? Um, so our rules were basically picking up on stuff that they shouldn't have been picking up on that was not in the training data. Um, and the data was inconsistent. So this was creating problems for both our rules and our model because our model didn't know what to think either. So what I decided to do was basically create a prodigy workflow to compare the, um, compare the output of the original data set with the, basically the model's predictions. Um, and what this would allow me to do was um, see whether the original data set had inconsistencies in the annotations um, and fix those potentially um, to be more consistent throughout the whole data set. Um, the reason I chose to do this with the integration of the original NER model was be basically because what models do by default um, is kind of pick up on um, consistencies within an entire data set. So this would allow me to um, basically look at consistencies that the model was picking up on and make educated decisions, educated guesses on what a better annotation might be. So I'll actually show that now. Um, so what we're gonna do is we're going to run Prodigy Review Train. Um, and I'm gonna show you basically one of the Prodigy recipes. This is the Prodigy Review recipe. Normally this is used to review um, annotations by different annotators. So if you have five different annotators on a data set, you'd be able to review those different annotations and see which one was actually right, which annotators messed up, and correct annotations as needed. However, instead of annotations, I'm actually using the original data set and then the original NER model that was trained on the original data set. Um, 
So we run Spacey project run prodigy view train is going to run this command and pop up with a web browser for us to look at. Um, great. So here you can see we have um, basically the Prodigy annotation interface. You can see all of our labels up here. Um, and you can see basically our annotation interface that I can adjust up here. You can see the original annotations down here and the NER models predictions down here. So looking at this first um, annotation, um, I can originally or already see that cost isn't really about a price. Um, I wouldn't necessarily label it as price because this doesn't have any information about the price in particular, it's just saying cost. So I'm gonna get rid of those annotations. However, dinner is definitely ours um, and it's not labeled here. So I'm gonna keep that. And John's Pizza Cafe is a restaurant name with both the original annotations and the NER model did. So then I can go ahead and click this screen check. Oh, it's going to save it into my session. Um, and then I can basically go through and label all these examples. Now you'll see here, my total is already 6,276. Why is that? Um, basically within Prodigy, I set a custom flag that said that whenever the NER model annotations are the same as the original annotations, it automatically accepts the um, annotation. So this saved me <laughs> about 7,000 annotations total. However, I still went through and did about um, 4,000 annotations. It took me about eight hours in total um, after getting the hang of it. Um, so this was super fun. Um, <laughs> and this allowed me to basically correct the data set, create more consistent annotations. Um, and review some of those problems that the original annotations had um, to better the NER model and the um, basically the span rule component, um, which I'll go into in a second. But I want to see if there was any questions that I could address first. We, move we on do. To the second segment. We do actually have a couple. Um, so we have someone who's been very patiently waiting <laughs> since before the demo. <laughs> Um, this is a really interesting question. You may not know, but I think they're talking about in regards to large language models, whether there's any zero shot entity extraction approaches you can use. So like shaping prompts in such a way when you, you know, query a large language model that will allow you to do named entity recognition. Do you know about anything like that? Yes. So actually I've been playing around with this as I've been testing um, Spacey LLM repo. Um, mm. which I said should be out soon. Um, we do actually have a few zero shot and also few shot um, built-in component recipes that you can try out. Um, this repo is still experimental, so it's still a work in progress. Um, but yeah. Um, so within the Spacey LMM repo, we have, I've been playing around with the text cat zero, um, mm -hmm. zero shot learning, um, which is super cool. Um, so definitely, um, but I think it's still a work in progress. Like sometimes you get some problems with it, but it's cool. Is there a special trick to the prompt? Like, is it literally just here is an input text, please extract, um, restaurant names from this or. Is um, so yeah. basically, um, I'm not quite sure on the way we framework this, but I think we're using mm. like Jinja templates to basically mm. template the um, the output that the NER model or that the uh, large language model is giving mm. um, to then do further. So then you can do move it into Spacey and do further classification on it. Um, and my screen just shut down and I'm not really sure why. <laughs> Give me one second. <laughs> That's super fun. <laughs> Okay, it's back. <laughs> excellent, excellent. No, no problems. You know, this it's the demo effect. It curses it's you. This the demo is the problem. Effect. That has yes. never happened before. <laughs> I have a conference next week. I'm really a bit I always get a bit nervous about this. Um, yeah. so so we have another question, which is um, so how could a model, so for example, English core web TRF, be fine-tuned to recognize features like streets, avenues, and roads, and what would be the quickest and easiest solution to do this? 
Yeah, so definitely. So if you go to our spacey documentation, which I can just do that right now, um, you can go to our model second section. Um, and within each model, we actually have um, accuracy evaluations for different parts of the model. Um, so this is what the accuracy evaluations are on the data sets it's trained on, obviously. Um, but what you can do is you can take this model and you can basically fine tune it towards your specific data set, right? Um, so you can take additional data, add it into the model, um, and basically make it better for your specific use case. Obviously, this depends on the data you have, on how accurate it's going to be. Um, but I think this is a super great way to at least like try out, see if it works. Mm -hmm. um, and it's super easy to like prototype this as long as you have the labeled data and try it out. Um, it really doesn't take that long. So. Yeah, and I think that's the thing too, like if you couple that then with Prodigy, if you don't have the labeled data already, it makes it much easier to create it. Yes, definitely. And then if you use Prodigy to label your data, you can basically directly train a model within Prodigy and then you don't even have to move into Spacey. Um, but it usually basically uses Spacey models behind the hood. Um, and then you can also move those over to Spacey if you want to do further evaluation. But yeah, um, super strong integration between those two. <laughs> As it should be. Makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Awesome. So they were actually the only two questions so far. Um, okay, perfect. So yeah, let's move on and I'll let you get to uh, the next part of the demo. Yes, definitely. So, um, so now we've reviewed all of our data and basically in the Spacey project, I have given you all my hard work. <laughs> I've included all my data within the Spacey project which you can find under the assets folder. It's the JSONL data here, um, which this is the test. There's about 1,521 notations. And then the train, um, you can see we're getting size <laughs> limits here. Um, this also has about like 7,000, I think. Um, so lots of data. Um, all my hard work for you. <laughs> um, <laughs> I've annotated this all um, with more consistent annotations. Um, and yeah, so now we have all of our reviewed data. I went through the Prodigy. Um, and basically Prodigy provides different handling for files. So we have our commands here for exporting the data out of Prodigy. And that's how we got these JSONL files. Um, and then we basically have to run another convert step to convert the JSON in these L files again into Spacey's binary formatting so we can train the model on it, um, which is our convert script. So this is an built-in functionality. We wrote a little script, um, but it's super simple. And that just lives in our scripts folder, convert.py. Um, so we convert it into Spacey data, and then we split it again into train, test, and dev sets, um, which you can find in various Corpus review. Um, so you can see all our data here. Um, review data. Um, and then basically we do the same process over again. So we train a model using Spacey Train. We set up our config with the NER component. And this is actually just the exact same config as before. Um, we set the review data instead of the original data, um, review dev set. We're still using the English large vectors and the output is a different training folder within training, but basically the same. So we run this, we get a trained NER model on the reviewed data. Um, and then we do basically the same thing again to assemble it with a span reload component. This time, however, I had a lot more contacts because I had been labeling data for eight hours. <laughs> so I decided to go back and write a whole new set of rules. Um, and you can find those rules again in scripts and rules.review.py. Um, and so these rules actually are a lot less. I think we only have 494 lines of rules um, and include stuff like rating for all the raves <laughs> and fun stuff like that. Basically, I took a look at the data and I was able to kind of figure out what the NER model was having trouble with. Um, because I had been annotating a lot of data and I had a really good sense of um, kind of what was going into my machine learning model at this point, which I honestly think is a really powerful thing to have. Um, if you want to create a good output, you need a good input and understanding your input is 
obviously like a, a good part of getting a good output. Um, so again, um, we are assembling this. Um, the config file is just slightly different. We have our new rules instead of our old rules. Um, in the bottom here, it's v2 instead of v1. Um, but everything else is the same. Um, again, we're passing in the tok to vec and the NER source for our review component um, and our new rules. So again, this will give us a model for a NER um, ruler. Um, and if we then evaluate this model, um, you can see that maybe this does a little bit better. So let's look at that. So this is the split data. And you can see here that we're no longer getting any um, uh, labels with um, basically uh, metrics that are decreasing. So we're getting accuracy that is higher for across the board, um, some by more than others, but all of them for like a pretty decent amount. And if we look at the overall um, basically increase, we do see that our um, NER model as a alone is better. You can see this is 86.68 and our original annotations were 76.52. However, we can't really go off of this too much um, because I was using the NER model to kind of adjust the annotations. Obviously the NER model is gonna get better because I'm adjusting the annotations to potentially be more similar to it. However, I am also creating um, more consistent data so it makes sense that the model is a bit less confused on basically what's going on. Um, so then I also have the span ruler component. So with the span ruler component, you can see that we actually get a higher increase. So this is moving up by almost 2% versus the 1% we saw above, which basically tells me that our roles are doing a better job of being roles, right? It's not being inconsistent with the data. It's doing a little bit better of a job. Um, and this is pretty cool. Um, like with just a rule-based system, we can increase our NER model with two points. Um, plus we get a better understanding of our data. Um, so basically what I wanna take from this is that understanding your data can have a really good effect on basically your entire pipeline from your models um, to your evaluation, um, to your basically your data annotation process. I mean, we use rules here to um, one, realize that there is something a little bit off about our data Two, make the data annotation process easier um, and faster. And three, basically getting better output, um, which is super cool. Um, yeah. So if you're interested in trying out this project yourself, as I mentioned, we have our projects repo. And if you go within our projects repo and then tutorials, um, you can see that our span ruler restaurant reviews is right here. Um, and this is the README. Um, and within our projects repo, we also have documentation on how to um, start up, how to, um, how to run this project, how to do it yourself. Um, and within the project, we have this cool thing called workflows. Um, so basically, no work required by you. All you have to do is run spacey project run all, and it will run it all. Um, it'll do the downloads command, the pre-processing, the training, the assembly, the evaluate, and then all the reviewing steps as well, um, which is super cool, super reproducible. And that's one of the things I really love about the Spacey project system. Um, yeah, so I think that's basically the basis of what I had to show. If there's any questions, I can go over that. If not, I can go over a few other things um, that we might have. I don't know how we're doing on time. <laughs> we're doing fantastic on time. Um, okay. So we did have um, another question. So the spacey GPE category is too broad for my use case. Can GPE be subclass? So if I make my own categories, will the built-in GPE interfere? Um, what would you suggest in this case? Um, I'm not entirely sure what they mean by the spacey GPE. Do they mean the... I know what? I'm, I'm not quite clear either. So Malik, would you mind clarifying what you mean by GPE if you're still in the webinar? 
Uh, in the meantime, while we're waiting <laughs> for Mel <laughs> to reply, um, so we have a question from someone who says that they're a novice at machine learning and NLP. So what resources can you recommending for learning about some of the fundamentals you've talked about? This is actually a very nice topic. That is a fantastic question. Um, the number one thing I can recommend is a, our um, a Spacey course. Um, so intro to Spacey course, sorry for the small thing. Give me one second. Um, basically we have a free online course um, which is advanced NLP with Spacey. So um, you can go through this. Enos, the co-founder of Spacey, basically created this. Um, there's everything from the basics of finding word and phrases for NLP um, to training a neural network model uh, within this course. Um, another thing I can recommend is basically checking out the projects, the tutorials um, within the projects, because this gives you a really good idea of basically how um, you can set up different projects for NER, um, named entity linking, um, relation components, the parser, spancat, span ruler, textcat. Um, we're continually adding more examples to this as well, um, which is super cool. Um, yeah, finally, like the Spacey documentation is probably one of my favorite documentation sites out there. <laughs> um, it's super clear. Um, we have a bunch of guides for getting started, um, linguistic features, rule-based matching, processing pipelines. Um, and if you follow this, if you have any questions, it's a super great resource as well. And I think too, just uh, speaking from my own experience, so I didn't do my education in natural language processing. I sort of had to learn on the job. Um, starting with this stuff is like, is where you need to start. Don't jump to like large yeah. language models initially. It's way too complicated. No. Yeah. Also, I feel like if you start with large language models, you're not going to have the basic foundation of understanding how like things work on the inside um, to kind of gain more advanced knowledge with the language models, you definitely need a bit more of the basic knowledge with the basic machine learning concepts. Yeah, um, agreed. Agreed. Mm -hmm. Also from my own experience, if you're looking for a broader course on machine learning, I don't know if you've done this course, Victoria, but um, Andrew Nung, he has a course on Coursera. It's not free, unfortunately, um, on machine learning. And it is amazing. <laughs> like it'll That is you super cool. Yeah, it's a really good course. Like it basically doesn't just teach you sort of uh, fundamental machine learning algorithms. It also teaches you like really important concepts like why you need a train and a test and a validation set and what overfitting is and things like this. So um, I really enjoy that course and I always recommend it. Super great recommendation. I've not taken it, but uh, I think I've heard of it actually, maybe from you, maybe from someone oh, else as well. Oh <laughs> <laughs> advertising at this point I tell everyone <laughs> um cool so Malik got back to us um no problem that you were typing on your phone no worries um so uh they said that it is geopolitical entity so to just oh. sort of read yeah read the question again basically saying that the spacey geopolitical entity category is too broad so can it be subclassed and if they make their own categories will the built-in um geopolitical entities interfere so lots of parts of this question. Um, yeah, so basically, I'm not quite sure because I've never done something like this before, but basically how would I approach this um, is I would take a standard spacing model and I would extract the geopolitical entity tag from it um, and just use that tag within the spacing model. And then maybe you could do additional labeling within Prodigy, for example, um, mm -hmm. to basically subclass those things Further, I mean, you would need some sort of labeled data to start subclassing. Um, it wouldn't just be able to do it by itself. Um, the spacey model ge geopolitical entity tag is the geopolitical entity tag. Um, but yeah, you could definitely use some labeled data, subclass that further, and then train another spacey model on those specific tags. Um, and I think that could work really well. Um, that would be my recommendations on how to go forward, but. I am also kind of new to this, so <laughs> try it out. Tell us how it works. And if you have any questions, we're also very active on our um, Spacey discussion board on GitHub. Um, so please always ask anything on there. Um, we are happy to help. 
Yeah, I can vouch that everyone I've met at Explosion is so nice. So <laughs> you are probably going to get some great help. A um, couple more questions. Um, can you speak to a possible timeline for the release of Spacey 3.6 and or 4.0? Yes. <laughs> so um, I'm not allowed to make promises <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, because we tend to be kind of bad at making the timelines we set for ourselves. Yeah, you and every sometimes. other set of developers. <laughs> it's it's really hard. Like problems come up that you don't expect. Um, and it, it is really hard. Um, mm. I think the most I can say is soon. <laughs> <laughs> um, 3.6 sooner than 3, 4.0. Um, but work is like continually being done on this. So like, um, we are in like getting better and better positions to release these. And there's honestly some really exciting changes coming up um, within 3.6, especially and 4.02. Um, super excited for it. Um, 4.0 for everyone who has dealt with Spacey since 2.0 um, is not going to be a breaking of a change as 2.0 to 3.0. We made a ton of changes from 2.0 to 3.0. Um, that basically like destroyed a lot of people's workflows. We're not going to do that again. It's mm -hmm. not going to be as bad. Um, but we are making some really exciting changes um, and having internal discussions a lot about how the best way to do these things is. So soon. <laughs> Excellent. We'll hold you to that. <laughs> <laughs> um, cool. So we have a question. Um, please comment about relation extraction. So I'm guessing... Um, maybe cosine similarities and things like that is probably what they're referring to. Uh, yeah, maybe we have a relation extraction component within Spacey. Mm -hmm. um, I don't remember. I think it may still be in our experimental repo, um, which mm -hmm. we do have a Sp Spacey experimental repo as well on GitHub. We have a lot of repos on GitHub. <laughs> um, <laughs> but basically, we also have a um, tutorial on Spacey projects and a really nice video. Um, so relation component here. Mm -hmm. um, so there's this really nice video on YouTube. Um, the link should be somewhere in here. But basically, this um, takes you through creating a novel um, NLP component to do relation construction from scratch. And Sophie, um, our lovely Spacey head, <laughs> as head of Spacey, <laughs> not Spacey head, <laughs> <laughs> uh, takes you through basically the whole process of defining and training a custom relation instruction component. I think this is one of our most watched videos. It's super helpful, super cool, honestly. It's, it's a great resource. Um, so if you're interested in learning more about that, we have this. Actually, we also just released a blog post. I forgot about this um, that I worked on. That's basically the video in blog post form. Um, so you, you can see here, super awesome. You can read also if you'd rather do that. Ah, oh, man, your graphic design is always so cool as well. I made um, this one. <laughs> yay. Yeah. Um, would you mind actually sending that link, uh, the previous link, and also the one for the course that you mentioned? So we've had a request for yeah, the course, absolutely. and I'm sure that people are probably interested in these. So, Oh, also, by the way, the course is available in different languages. Um, which oh, is yay. Cool. Uh, cool. Send it in the chat. Yes, if you're able to. Okay. That one? Maybe? Yes, perfect. I have it. Great. So cool. I will paste those in a second. Um, and yeah, let me know when you're ready. And then I have another, a couple of other questions for you. Okay. Here's <laughs> all the relation extraction um, stuff. Awesome. Yeah. Perfect. Yep. I've got all of those. So I will post those in a second in the chat to those of us, uh, those of you who are listening. Uh, so in the meantime, uh, next question we have, is there a way to use GPT 3.5 to help with labeling? I like this question because we just talked about this. Yes. So actually there is. Um, so um, within Prodigy, we've released a separate package for basically combining open AI with um, with Prodigy to do labeling. Um, might take me a second to find that. So I'm not actually gonna do it right now. Um, but uh, if you go onto our 
Prodigy, um, I think actually maybe it's, let me see if I can find it real fast. Prodigy, open AI recipes. Yeah, this is the one. Um, so we've provided different recipes for working with GPT um, within Prodigy, which basically allows you to pre-label examples based on GPT's output um, within the, for example, NER classification interface. Um, so super cool, um, definitely works. And um, I think it provides different like TextCat, name to recognition, um, and all the docs are here. So definitely check it out, super cool resource. Um, and I think soon to be built within Prodigy as well. So keep an eye out for that. Awesome. Um... Couple more questions. Is Prodigy free to use? Prodigy is not free to use. Um, so basically we have our um, Get Prodigy fee, uh, page right here. So personal license versus company license. Um, we do also provide academic licenses. So if you're an academic um, researcher, we provide a free three month license to get started and keep working. Um, basically, with Prodigy licenses, it's a one-time purchase. You get 12 months of free upgrades um, and basically lifetime access to Prodigy besides that, um, which is, I think, a super cool way to do software. It's not a, like a monthly subscription or something. Cool. And one final question, maybe? Probably. I think maybe this is going to need to be the last one. Um, so is it possible to use Cohere LLMs rather than OpenAI? So we do have different um, we do have different cap um, what do you call it? integrations with different LMMs. We are working on expanding this right now. I am not quite sure if Cohere is going to be in the 1.0 release of Spacey LMMs, um, but it will all be um, in our documentation. So when that gets released, um, definitely go check that out. Um, I think we have OpenAI right now. I, Pretty sure we have Dolly Hugging Face, definitely. Mm -hmm. um, but on that, I am not sure what integrations we provide to L1.0. But we are really wanting to release more um, integrations, especially for open source models. Um, so, yeah. Awesome. I think we're actually out of questions. Like I said, that was going to be the last one. Um, Thank you so much to everyone in the audience for such great engagement. Like it really, really makes the webinars much more interesting for us when we know that you're interested and you're asking us questions. And thank you so much to Victoria, of course, for all of her time and hard work and showing her expertise. So um, let's actually jump back over to you, Victoria. Um, were there any kind of other links that you wanted to show other than the ones you've shown um, already? I'm not sure. I think that's pretty much it. Um, obviously, mm. if you stop our GitHub, you'll find a lot of cool nuggets. <laughs> um, um, yeah, we have a ton of resources basically everywhere. I remember when I first started working in the company, I was like, where do I start? There's so much to learn just about the company, not even about the industry. Um, <laughs> you could spend a lifetime going through our documentations. Um, and definitely, um, if you have any questions at all, we are here on GitHub Discussions to help, um, also Prodigy support to help. Um, anything from the very basic questions to the more complicated bugs, we are here for you. So yeah. Yeah, and like that's the thing as well with Space, you can start super simple and it is it is very, very accessible. So. You don't need to jump into pipelines if it's a bit scary initially. Yeah, I started with the linguistic features. I started using um, actually the um, like part of speech tagging. Mm -hmm. just, just looking at <laughs> just looking what at I did too. Things. Yes. Yeah. Um, the first project I ever did with Python actually just used the spacey part of speech tagger. So you can start yeah. super simple and one day <laughs> you'll be. <laughs> you'll realize you know even less than when you than like when you started. <laughs> but that's okay. <laughs> cool. So I think in that case, um, if you have nothing else to show, we can maybe jump over to the wrap-up slides. Um, so 
here we have um, PyCharm's contact details, but more importantly, we have Victoria and Explosion's contact details. So if you want to see any more of the amazing work she's doing, and it is amazing, uh, she has a blog post actually about this topic. So if you know, you're more of a like reader rather than a visual person, you want to rewatch the webinar, you can go and visit that. Um, so yeah, let's finish up here. Thank you again. I really enjoyed the presentation. Um, big fan of Spacey. Obviously, a lot of people in the audience are too. And yeah, it's just super, super exciting to be in this space right now. So really appreciated you taking the time to show like what's possible. I am also very excited to be in the space. It's I feel like there's something new every day, and I really loved sharing basically what I love talking about, what I love doing with all of you here today. Um, so it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. No problem. And we're always looking for ways to make our webinars better at JetBrains. So please do reach out to us on Twitter, or we're going to send out an after webinar survey. So please do let us know your opinions there. We promise we do actually read them. This is why we're doing more uh, machine learning stuff at the moment. So your feedback is always appreciated. And that's everything for today. So Thank you again for tuning in. You've been an amazing audience. I hope you enjoyed the webinar as much as I did and enjoy the rest of your day or your evening. Bye. Bye.